In this video, we're once again going to consider the characteristics of efficient property rights and look at the, specifically at the case of exclusivity and when all of exclusivity is not satisfied. So let's start by thinking about a classic private good, uh, a bowl of cereal. Now, a bowl of cereal is exclusive. That is, I can exclude you from um, that bowl of cereal. If I own it, I get to eat it. Furthermore, uh, the good is rival. If I take a bite of the cereal, um, then you don't get that bite. Now, it's not this. This does not mean that you can't share it. Of course, I could give you a bite and then take a bite for myself. But the bite itself is rival. Only one person can get the good at a time. Now we compare that to public goods. Public goods are goods such that when the benefits or costs that flow from it fall on everyone, and these benefits or costs do not change no matter how many people are gaining or suffering from that good. Uh, that is, the benefits are non-exclusive and they're non-rival. Let's look at a couple of examples. A classic example is that of the Grand Canyon. Now remember the Grand Canyon gives us uh, existence value. That is, all of the citizens of the United States enjoy the fact that the Grand Canyon exists. Those values that we get from the Grand Canyon are non-exclusive. All right, So I can't exclude you from enjoying the fact that the Grand Canyon exists. And they're not rival. The fact that you enjoy the Grand Canyon does not in any way diminish how much I can enjoy the Grand Canyon. Some of the classic goods that are provided by um, governments are usually thought of as public goods. Let's think about national defense. Uh, national defense, once the uh, US government puts in national defense, um, everybody gets it. No one is excluded from that um, that uh, service and it's non-rival in the sense that if you benefit from national defense that does not in any way diminish how much national defense I get. City parks are also um, on a much smaller scale uh, usually thought of as public goods. Uh, they're non-exclusive in the sense that once it's a city park everybody can get in and use the good and they're usually thought of as non-rival in the sense that uh, you know anybody everybody can use them and the fact that you're using the park doesn't diminish how much I can enjoy it now clearly rivalry in the case of city parks is not quite perfectly satisfied in the same sense here there there's a picture of a bunch of people sitting on park benches and it looks like most of the benches are full so uh, when I show up at this park I there is some rivalry uh, I can't sit on that same bench but at normal levels of use we still usually think of as city parks as public goods now why is it that uh, public goods are provided by the public sector um, and we're going to look at the the why this happens theoretically uh, using a very simple case. And imagine there's an island. All right, we've got two people on the island, Al and Betty. Uh, and Al and Betty both uh, want to build parks. All right, so we've got this company uh, that is the park building company, and and the park building company will uh, or has a marginal cost curve that's exhibited here as upward sloping marginal cost curve. The more park um, that is uh, uh, produced, the more it costs for each additional uh, square foot of that park. Um, and Al has demand for this parkland uh, that is uh, demonstrated in the downward sloping uh, demand or marginal willingness to pay curve. Now, uh, we see that in this case, if there was a perfect market, we'd have a, a, a equilibrium quantity, which is uh, indicated there with the dotted line. At that quantity, Al gets benefits, right? He's, his total willingness to pay is going to be the area underneath his demand curve out to that quantity. Uh, but of course, he'd have to pay some market price. And we're going to assume that there's a perfectly efficient market here so that the market clearing price is PP, uh, leading to a cost to Al of that red uh, rectangle there. All right. So Al's left with consumer surplus, that is that green area there. All of that's very, very familiar. All right. Of course, the um, company that uh, produces the park also has costs. Uh, that's going to be the area underneath the marginal cost curve out to QP. All right. And they get revenue from AL, which is going to be, again, that same uh, uh, rectangle. But in this case, now it's a good thing for the, for the company that's producing the parks. The company then is left with uh, 
producer surplus, which is going to be that green triangle as indicated there. When we take the consumer surplus and producer surplus, we indicate by the familiar triangle the welfare gains associated with this park provision problem. So all is good. We've had a perfectly efficient market. Al bought park. He got consumer surplus. The company provided park. They got um, uh, producer surplus. Uh, it looks like everything's working well. The problem arises because there's Betty out there. All right. Betty also gets the benefits in the park. Al paid for them, but Betty gets the benefits without paying a dime. So her benefits, her net benefits, is that whole polygon there indicated by the orange area. So when we put together Al's benefits and Betty's benefits to get our social benefits, we've got to stack Betty's benefits on top of uh, the uh, the demand curve for Al leading to uh, net benefits where, which are going to be the green triangle plus that orange polygon uh, that's indicated there. Now you may ask, so what's the problem? It looks good. We've actually got more benefits uh, than uh, we would have had uh, with only Al there. Well, the problem is this. If you look at where the societal demand curve or societal marginal willingness to pay curve crosses the marginal cost curve, we know that would be the socially efficient quantity of the park land uh, because that's where our first equimarginal principle is satisfied. But Betty has no incentive to actually go out and buy more land because the marginal willingness to pay of Betty is already, since we've assumed it's the same as the marginal willingness to pay curve for Al, it's already equal to price. And so she doesn't want to buy any more than Al's already purchased. Uh, so Al, Betty is going to be a free rider. She's going to stop at QP, not purchase any more, and we're left with a welfare cost uh, in the triangle there because we didn't get out to the point where the socially efficient level of, of production was achieved. So we're at an under provision of the good uh, in the classic externality sense uh, because of the free rider problem. Now to check that you really understand how this uh, plays out in this simple theoretical model, what I'd like you to do is uh, take a piece of paper and draw the demand curve for Al and the demand curve for Betty and stack them up as we've done here. But now assume that there's some other person on this island, Carol, who also gets benefits from the use of this public good. How does the socially efficient quantity change and how does the welfare cost change? You should find that the the welfare cost is increasing as we uh, increase the number of people on the island. So